I'm Dan Sheeks, and this is the Earn and Invest Podcast. When I was a teenager, I had no interest in money. My plan was to be a doctor, and my conception of wealth was much more tethered to my profession than the stock market. A few decades later, burned out at work, I discovered the financial independence retire early or fire community. If only I had started earlier. If I had saved, invested, built passive income streams, it sounds great, but there was a certain charm to the path that I had chosen to take. How much would I have missed out on if I pursued fire right out of high school? How much would I have gained? Dan Cheeks is the author of the forthcoming book, First to a Million, A Teenager's Guide to Achieve Early Financial Freedom, which introduces teenagers to the strategies, concepts, and the mindsets needed to achieve early financial independence. Dan, welcome to Earn and Invest. Tell us, what kind of person was the teenage Dan Sheeks? Was he interested in personal finance? Did he have any conception of this idea of financial independence? Teenage Dan Sheeks had no interest in personal finance, except for that he wanted to be rich. That was his only goal. That's interesting. So you knew you were interested in money, but didn't have a real specific concept of what that meant or how to make it. No, yeah. I had no mentors or no one to teach me about money and and money strategies and personal finance. I didn't learn any of those strategies or concepts until much later in life. Also, later in life, decided i that being rich wasn't necessarily that important. You know, I kind of matured and grew up a little bit. I am a public school teacher. So obviously making a big fat salary wasn't the end all be all of my career choice. Everyone changes over time. And I guess I'm one of those as well. Yeah. Tell us how you got into public school teaching, because certainly a high schooler planning to be rich. Now, this is not a criticism, but that probably wouldn't be the field you go into. When did that pivot take place? Yeah, I don't and going back. So when I was in college, I was a business major. I, I actually made fun of my friends who were education majors. Like, why would you ever <laughs> want to teach kids all day and make no money? That sounds like why would you ever want to do that? I made fun of them. And then yeah, a few years later, I went back to school to get my teaching license. The tipping point, I think I just realized that money wasn't the end all be all. Like I said before, I did want to give back. I wanted to make a difference. I wanted a, an occupation that would be fulfilling and rewarding. I had friends that were teachers and they seemed to really love what they were doing. To be honest, the summer's off benefit sounded like a pretty good deal to me. I loved to travel at the time, still do. So there wasn't a specific like aha moment, but I at some point just realized, you know what, maybe I'll just teach business in high school and, and that'll be my thing. So I went back to school and that's what I did. So talk to us about how that pivot affected your choice to teach financial independence to kids. So what you're kind of saying here is, you know, I realized that money and wealth maybe at that point wasn't as important, started looking into meaning, decided to teach. Teaching business made sense, right? Because that's what your degree was in out of college. Why teach kids about financial independence? Going back to your intro, you nailed it. When you said, you know, most of us, probably your listeners are all included. We all say to ourselves, man, I wish I would have known this stuff earlier. And when I think back to that teenage Dan Sheiks, absolutely. I wish somebody would have sat me down or gave me a book or told me about a podcast, even though they didn't exist back then and said, hey, you need to listen to this. And even though you may not decide to make certain decisions right now that affect your financial well-being in the present, at least you know there are other options. There are these ideas out there. And so once I did become more aware of my personal finance strategies. And once I did become aware of the early financial independence movements, and my wife and I have been investing in real estate as well for a few years, it just was, you know, a light kind of just went on. And I'm, I, I'm with teenagers all day, every day. My passion is working with young people, been doing it for almost two decades. And I teach business. Why not also teach them about these very different strategies, the, the, the five financial independence strategies on top of what I'm already teaching them. So yeah, I've been doing that for the last few years. You know, both my story that I told a little bit of in the introduction and your story, how you started to teach, both gel in the sense that I think it took took us both some years in maturation to start understanding what enough 
really means. Can kids grasp that concept? I know for me, and I was a pretty mature kid, but I don't know if I really understood what enough really looks like. I think so. I think teenagers understand it better than most, honestly. And this is why, and even like college age kids. So my my wheelhouse is 15 to 25 years old. That's how I like to kind of frame it. So Gen Z that's in that age, enough plus, in my book, I talk about enough plus a little. That's kind of where you should be at. They grasp it because they have not yet begun a lifestyle of luxury items and extravagant spending and, and wasteful spending, right? They're not used to that lifestyle. Their parents may engage in that, but it's they're not seeing you know, the books and the accounting and, and the money coming and going. And so working with young people, I actually kind of say, I took the easy path when it came to financial education. I think working with adults, it would be much more difficult because they've made so many big mistakes that take years, sometimes decades to recover for. But when I'm working with teenagers, they are a clean slate. They have not yet dug themselves into a hole with student loan debt. They have not yet crashed their credit score. They don't even have one. They have not yet in, uh, you know, inflated their lifestyle to be spending every dollar they make. So they're pretty easy to convince and, and to teach like, hey, to avoid these mistakes, here's what you should do. And one of them is buy yourself the things that you value, which is enough. Treat yourself every once in a while, which is a little bit extra and save and invest all the rest. You know, it's an interesting point. You say that the kids are a blank slate. When I talk about my financial upbringing, I often say that I'm a product of the modeling that my parents presented to me. Do you find yourself undoing some of what these kids are learning at home? At times. And when I say they're a blank slate, I mean that they haven't themselves made mistakes, but you're absolutely right. They, they have learned habits from their parents, most likely. Some of them good, some of them bad, depending on their household. But yeah, I think... You can you can retrain them pretty easily. I mean, they haven't, like I said, they haven't come up with their own money habits. And modeling is a is a huge influence on them, but you can also show them, you know, the the pros and cons and advantages of making wise money decisions, using money intentionally, and then the rewards that would come after that. So you're never gonna, you know, successfully make every single young person a financial wizard who can retire at age 30. That's that's not my mission. But my mission is to educate and inform as many of them as I can so that they at least have the knowledge and the options available to then do what they want. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We use the moniker FI or FIRE, financial independence or financial independence retire early because truthfully it gets people's attention. But as I'm reading your book, what I'm realizing is you know, the goal is not nearly as important as the habits. So maybe a lot of these kids might not eventually be interested in such a thing as financial independence, but the habits that we learn, the traditional teachings we learn to get to financial independence will serve them whether they get to that ultimate goal or not. Yes, you, uh, you, you nailed it. And so I tell the young people I work with, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you have the nine to five till you're 65 grind, which is what the majority of Americans do. And in my book and all the time I say, there's nothing wrong with that pathway. It is proven. It is a very noble way to live. And it has worked for millions and millions of people. There's nothing wrong with that. On the other end of the spectrum, you have this, you know, pedal to the metal, balls to the wall, early fi uh, group of people who are reaching that, you know, financial independence in their late 20s, mid 20s, 30s, 40s. Then there's all this room in between, you know, between say 30 and 65. That's a lot. That's three and a half decades of time where you can fall anywhere in between there. And I tell the young people, I say, it's, it is up to you to decide what path you want to take. You can be on the way on this side. You could be on the other side, or you could be somewhere in the middle. There is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. I want them to understand the pros and cons of the decisions for both ways. And if they want to fall right in the middle, then that's absolutely fine as well. Now, on the cover of your book, you say, and I'm going to quote you here, be different about money, be bold about your life, be a FI freak. Tell me about using the word freak here. This is something you do throughout the book. And I know it's kind of fun. And in a sense, it's a little tongue in cheek. But some people think of that as a little more of a derogatory word. 
Why do you think it's apt to convey your message about financial independence in teens? Number one, it rhymes with my last name. So that's, <laughs> I, that I did notice where, that. Yes. Yeah. That was where it came from. And my community is called Sheik's Freak. So that's, that's where that was born. But honestly, it, it's a little bit triggering for some. It definitely catches the attention, the word freak, right? It can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But anyone who knows teenagers knows that chore number one is to get their attention. If you don't have their attention, then they're, I, I could have named the community. I could have named the book, you know, Financial Independence for Teens snoozer, right? The teens aren't going to light up for that. So when I call them freaks, they, they kind of say, what, what, what's going on here? And, and the idea behind that is that if you are young and you are motivated enough to pay attention to your money, to learn about your financial future, to engage in, you know, Zoom calls and podcasts and YouTubes and communities that talk all about finances and, and these early five strategies, then you are very different. That is not normal. You are exceptional. And so you are a freak, but in a good way. So that's where that came from. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of of the way we talk about terms like geek or nerd, uh, which are a lot cooler now than it used to be. This idea that it was okay to take another path. The fire path or financial independent retire early path was really fairly unknown or not talked about as, as little as a decade ago. The students come into your class, they're teenagers. Have they ever heard of the FIRE movement? Is this something that they've encountered before? No, I mean, I, maybe there's one random kid out there out of 100 that says, oh, yeah, I know the FIRE movements. But and, and, you know, honestly, I think I have a kid in my class right now who I just found out. I had a guest speaker in my class the other day, a, a guy that works at Bigger Pockets who was in there talking about his story. And at the end of the class, the student came up to me and, and the speaker and said, Hey, I I watch YouTube videos about this stuff all the time. And Graham Stefan was the guy that he really paid attention to. And he said, I I know these strategies. It's really something I'm interested in. And, you know, he connected with the guest speaker before he left. And I think, you know, that kid probably probably did know what early financial independence was, or at least had heard of it. But yeah, 99.5% of them, they they don't know what that is. And when I when I introduced the idea to them that, hey, I don't, you know. You may not know this, but there's another option besides that nine to five till your 65 grind. You could retire in your 50s, 40s, 30s, possibly even 20s. And then they start to say, well, well, that's interesting. Tell me more. That word retire, though, in fire, most people in the fire movement don't like that word. And and I, I reframe it when I talk to my kids. I say, the goal here is not to reach financial independence at age, fill in the blank, and then never work another day in your life. That's not going to happen. But that's how most people would define retirement is you're done working forever. And when you're 65, that's a good thing because you've worked many, many years and you deserve to take the rest of your life off. But if you're reaching that at a very early age, everyone I know that has reached FI early in life, they don't pack it up and play video games and watch TV for the rest of their life. They are just venturing out into new different passions, starting businesses, continuing to invest perhaps in real estate, whatever. Maybe they maybe they keep working. Maybe they love their job. I'm still working. I'm a teacher and I love my job. I'm not going anywhere for a while. It just, you know, you have all these options once you get to financial independence, but none of them really are, I will never work another day in my life. So that word retire is not perfect, but it does make for a great acronym. When I introduce this idea of financial independence or retire early or or not to an adult crowd, I met with a bunch of skepticism. And I'm wondering, do you get the same from the kids? Do they buy into this idea right away? Or are they like the adults with like, no, that that can't work? I I would say for the most part, they buy in. And and that's something I have to be very careful with as a teacher of teenagers who, you know, some are naive and some kind of believe everything they hear type of thing. I have to understand, and I do, that I am a trusted adult in their life, a person of authority. And so they're going to tend to believe everything I tell them. Now, I believe fully in the early financial independent strategies. I don't believe it's for everybody, which I tell them all the time. I do believe everyone should know it's an option. And so they generally, I think, believe that those strategies are possible. And then they kind of just depend uh, or make up their own minds about whether it's the right choice for them. 
Let's talk about this idea of the American dream. When I talk about it, I often talk about the American dream script. Do you think it's inappropriate for kids today? Or at least do you think we're selling them, you know, a bag of goods that isn't necessarily how it has to be? I do. I I think it's chapter two in my book is titled why you should tell the American dream to F off. Um, again, it, it's all about getting the attention of the kids. But there's, you know, there's the version of the American dream that go to high school, get good grades, get into a good college, get good grades, graduate from college, get a good job, get married, have kids, have a dog, have a wife, pick a fence and work till you're 65 and then enjoy the good life. That traditional American dream pathway is not broken, nothing wrong, but it's only one of many, many options. So I think we are doing a disservice to not only our youth, but honestly, every American, when we lead them into believing that that is the only path. As you start getting into the traits that are key to a teenager's financial independence journey, you make number one, a propensity to break rules. Tell me about that. I was kind of interested in, in scandalized a little to see that as coming from the mouth of a teacher of all things when talking about Mm -hmm. teenagers. Why is that important to your path to financial independence? Great question. I think, you know, that propensity to break rules is, is more of a mindset descriptor and the people that I know who are on the path or who have reached early FI have, have a pretty specific mindset of I can do whatever I set out to do. And if I want to reach financial independence early in life, then then by God, I'm going to do it. And so that mindset for a young person is pretty key in in that journey. And so going back to that young, by the way, that that young student who recently approached the guest speaker, he is the one student in that class that drives me the most nuts. He's, (laughs) He's usually the last one in the door, you know, a little bit tardy. He's talking. He's very boisterous. He is not your I'm going to follow every rule kind of kind of kid. He's not disrespectful. He's not, you know, too much to handle, but he is not playing by the rules all day, every day. And he's okay with that. And I think that mindset is something that allows him to be more open to ideas that all of his peers aren't going to follow, if that makes sense. Like he's okay to walk down a different path by himself. He's not worried about how he looks or how people perceive him because of different choices. You said this in the book and it really caught me by surprise in a pleasant way. You know, you kind of said, look, the C and the D students can do just as well as financial independence as the A students. In fact, maybe they'll do better. Yeah. And that speaks to that exact point we were just making that sometimes those C and D students are, are just as smart as the A student, but their mindset is such that they are a little bit more they just don't like to follow the rules, a little bit more rebellious, right? That's not to say they're not as smart. I, I do believe that every every teenager has a high amount of intelligence. It's just dependent on, you know, we, we all have our different skill sets. And so a C or D student is already okay with not looking the perfect, not not fitting that stereotypical perfect mold. And so to convince them to go off a beaten path and try something very different from the norm, they're usually more open to that idea. So let's get into some specifics of how young people can start looking at financial independence. Let's jump right to passive income. Is passive income something that teenagers understand? Not at first, but man, when you explain it to them, wow, do they light up. In my book, and there's there's a workbook that goes along with it that I didn't have the chance to send you, Doc, but in the book, in the workbook, it it gets them on a journey through the workbook of starting to earn passive income very early. Most Americans, adults, go their entire lifetime without earning any passive income. They probably couldn't even define passive income. And so for kids to not only know what it is, but to have some of it coming in, even if it's just $10 a month, that's still money that they make without doing any work or very, very little work, right? They're making money while they sleep kind of thing. So once I define it and I give them some examples, they, they, they pay attention. Like that sounds like a winner to them and really to everybody. 
I've noticed that when you talk about different means of getting income, you talk about three different types. You talk about active income, passive income, and portfolio income. Just as a side, I'm surprised you separated portfolio and passive income because to me, they always seemed very much, pretty much the same thing. Yes. Full disclosure, I stole that from Robert Kiyosaki. I gave him full credit in the book, but in it, he, he has, of course, his Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, but he also has a Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Four Teens subsection book. And in that book, he talks about those three income streams. And I, I agree, portfolio income and passive income could be lumped together, but he separated them out. And so I just thought I'd, I'd keep it the same. While we're still talking about the income side, there's a heavy push towards real estate in the book. And I'm wondering if that is the most viable way for kids to get into passive income. Because a lot of people feel like the hurdle, especially when you're young to getting into real estate, is a big one to climb. Most, I would say almost everyone thinks that. But truth is that if you follow certain steps, getting into real estate at a young age is, is actually very simple. It does require some planning. It does require some effort, does require some grind and some hustle. But in my community where I work with many, many young people, they are buying real estate at 19, at 20. I think I have an 18-year-old who's under contract on his first property. They're all house hacking, which is a strategy we can talk about. It's the best strategy by far for young people to get into real estate investing, but it is absolutely doable. And, And I highly recommend it for any young person who's up to the challenge. Go ahead and describe house hacking for our listeners. Yeah. House hacking in its simplest terms is buying a property as a primary residence and then either renting out the other bedrooms in, say, that single family house, or maybe you bought a small multifamily, duplex, triplex, quadplex, and you rent out the other units and possibly even the extra bedroom in your half of the duplex perhaps. And so the rent that you bring in from from those roommates or housemates or tenants helps pay the the bills for the property, mortgage, utilities, everything. And sometimes you can even live for free. Sometimes you can even make a little money by, by house hacking. It's a strategy that's not for everybody, but it is a strategy that's really caught fire the last two to three years because of communities like Bigger Pocket and a lot of success stories that were born in that strategy. So we've been talking up to this point about the income side of the equation. Let's move to the other side of the equation. You talk quite a bit about tracking and spending. You even go into concepts like the 4% rule, which are the 4% safe withdrawal, which helps us decide how much money we need to live passively off our portfolio. Is this something teenagers understand? I imagine when you're at that age, you know, you've never lived independently. You don't know what it's like to have to pay the rent or the bills, the water, the electric. You don't know about commuting or buying clothes for work. Like those are kind of complex concepts. Is it something teenagers can grasp? Because they haven't really been on their own yet. So it's hard to know, for instance, 4% of what or 25 times what, you're not exactly sure how much you're going to spend when you're actually adulting in the future. Yeah, it is. It is a higher level concept for sure. But, but I, I, I have done it many times in my classroom. I talk about the 4% rule. I obviously talk about frugality and, and the high savings rate. But when I talk about the 4% rule, I just throw some numbers up on the board as an example. And they, they typically follow along. I think it's, you know, as, as a teacher for many years, you, one of the things I, I think I get pretty good at is explaining things in a way that makes sense to even someone who's at a, a very, very basic knowledge level. And so just explaining it in a way that hopefully all of my students can understand. And you know, based on their reactions and their questions, I think most of them do understand. It's at, at a surface level, it's really not that complicated of a mathematical equation. When you really dig deep into the numbers and the the analytics and the data, it can get very I mean, I don't even understand all of the different analytics that are that are embedded in the 4% rule and how it was calculated originally in the Trinity study. But at a, at a, at a very super surface level, yeah, the students definitely understand it and can see that as a possible way to reach financial independence.
We're talking with Dan Sheeks. He is the author of the forthcoming book, First to a Million, A Teenager's Guide to Achieving Early Financial Freedom. We're going to take a short break. I'm Doc G, and this is Earn and Invest. Let me tell you, when I first learned of the stock market and decided to get into it, I was so confused. What do I invest in and how do I invest? I know a lot of you are having the same issue, and that is why I'm so excited about Public.com. On Public.com, you can start with small slices of shares, invest in what you believe in with any amount, but it's not just a place to invest, but also a social platform. It makes it easy to learn and invest and surrounds you with a community of others who are investing in stocks and ETFs as well as crypto. And most importantly, you can invest with built-in educational features that help you learn as you go. And you can invest safely with volatility reminders that let you know investments like crypto are a little riskier. Start investing with as little as $1 and get a free slice of stock up to $50 when you join public.com today. Visit public.com slash EAI to download the app and sign up using code EAI. That's public.com slash EAI and use code EAI. This is valid for U.S. residents 18 and older, subject to account approval. See public.com slash disclosures. This is not investment advice. Dan Sheeks' book, First to a Million, A Teenager's Guide to Achieving Early Financial Freedom, introduces teenagers to the strategies, concepts, and the mindset needed to achieve early financial independence. Dan, I was excited to see that you tackle the controversial subject of college. Now, you are a high school teacher. We would expect that your suggestion would be that all teenagers go to college but the decision isn't that simple, is it? No, <laughs> and neither was writing that chapter. I think the book has 28 or 29 chapters. Two of them are on college. One is, should you go to college or should you not? And another one is, if you do go to college, how do you make it work? And still you know, be on a path to early financial independence. Those two chapters are by far the hardest to write in, in the entire book because there's a lot of emotion there's a lot of tradition and there's a lot of expectations embedded in though in, in that decision. I start off the chapter, I believe, by saying that I'm not here to tell anybody what to do. I'm just going to give you the pros and cons of college and how that can play into a, an early five pathway. And absolutely, I say in the book, you know, some of you definitely should go to college. If you want a career that's that requires a degree, then that's the way you got to go. But you, you better know that that's what you want to do for at least 10 years because you need to get your investment a return on that investment. So that is that is a tough concept. As a high school teacher, and, and I teach at a very high performing public school, it's probably not a, a topic that some of my colleagues would be happy that I'm talking about. But as college prices creep up and up and up, and maybe maybe creep isn't the right word, as they skyrocket up and up and up, more and more people are really debating the idea of is college worth the money? And I think it's a justified debate. And so in that chapter, the, the one that says college or no college, I, I definitely dig into all of that stuff. But, but at the end, I say, now that you know the pros and cons and how that plays into an early five pathway, only you can decide and your family what is the best choice for you. Do you feel like you can have such a frank discussion in the classroom too? I mean, you have a very frank discussion in the book. Do you feel as free to have that talk in the classroom? I, I I do bring the subject up, and but I keep it brief, right? I school teachers are really really busy, and the last thing I need is a bunch of phone calls from parents <laughs> asking me why why did you tell my kid that he shouldn't go to college? Even you know I, I wouldn't say that, but if they uh, received the message that way, I would be getting some phone calls. I was about to say, do you get feedback from parents? I mean, even things like talking about financial independence is a little controversial. You ever get pushback uh, from kids' parents saying, hey, you know, I'm not sure that that's the best thing for them to be learning right now. To date, I have gotten parents, two or three, that have contacted me saying, thank you. Or I had one parent contacting me saying, I want you to teach me more. I want to know more about this because I don't know much about personal finance. So would you, would you mind teaching me a little bit about these concepts? What's interesting about the book is 
you really go deeply into the theory of why kids should learn about financial independence, but you do go further towards the end. You actually put out the five free checklists. Tell us about that checklist and, and how can kids and parents use it? Yes. So great question. The five freak checklist is at the end of the book in the appendix. And so basically if a teenager has read the book and, and, and they, they like what they're reading it makes sense to them and they want to, can, they want to get on that journey to early five, that's where the checklist step comes in. So the, che- it's a, it's a series of incremental units of time, four months, four months increments of time starting in high school and going for about five years. And so every four months, the list will tell them in my mind, here are the things that you should do in that four month time period. And then the next four months will hit uh, freak phase two. Here's what you should do in this four month uh, period of time. Now the workbook that I mentioned, the first two million uh, workbook is the five freak checklist, but it's, it's them embellished on, you know, I I don't just say, here's what to do. I say, here's what to do, when to do and how to do it. And I give them a lot more information about what exactly they should be doing within that checklist to set themselves up on a journey to five. The checklist is very flexible. It's not rigid. You can start it freshman year of high school or before you can start it when you're 30, honestly, and you're just working through that checklist every four months, getting some things done It includes all different types of things to uh, help you make some smart money decisions. Including a book reading list. You're not going to get off going through this checklist without doing a decent amount of reading. Yeah. Every freak phase has at least one other book they should read. I would not for a minute sit here and say that my one book and my one workbook contain all of the knowledge that you need. Absolutely not. They're expected to read one book every four months. So another part of the book that I wanted to talk about is you have the featured freak section. So this is where you highlight some stories of some young people and how they're managing their money, what their aspirations are, et cetera. I want to be a little bit critical on this one. And the reason why is I feel like you feature a lot of young people who either say that they're financially independent or soon going to be financially independent. And most of these people haven't really even been in the workplace for a decade how realistic is this? It is realistic. I definitely highlighted there's six featured free case studies in the book. There's actually uh, a bunch more in bonus content from the Bigger Pockets website when you purchase the book there. But I definitely highlighted some members. Uh, I think Jabbar is the youngest member. He's 19 at the time. At the time he wrote the case study for me and answered my questions, he had, I think, just closed on his first property or maybe hadn't. As I sit here today, I can tell you that Jabbar at age 20 is closing on his second property, has private investors, and is looking to buy other properties with partnerships. He's crushing it. He's a pretty extreme. He is a freak in all (laughs) aspects of that term. And he has an incredible thirst for knowledge. And he's he's an amazing kid. Also in the Marines full-time. But yeah, I, I put those in there to let the reader know that it's absolutely possible because nothing in there is made up. It's all facts. And these are case studies of young people who are doing it. I think most of the case studies, are young people who have reached FI in their 20s or maybe early 30s. But again, going back, that doesn't mean that they're done working for life. You know, they've, they have now met the FI equation, which my book talks about, meaning that their passive income is higher than their living expenses, but their living expenses are so low, mostly because of house hacking and frugality, that it's not a lifestyle they want to do, you know, when in their 30s or 40s, when they get married and have kids, their expenses will go up. But at that point in time, they don't have to work. So they're they're choosing to do other things to earn money that they're more passionate about, that can maybe be more risky, like starting a business that are going to pay off huge dividends. And those are options that the person who got a corporate job right out of college, they, they just don't have those options. Earn and invest listeners will also recognize a number of those other featured freaks. I think you have Craig Kirlop in there. You have Cody Berman, Rachel Richards, all people who've been on the show. Definitely excellent top level people, people who are very driven. I think it does kind of show us the fact is that, that, 
you can succeed, but it takes a certain amount of drive. And I think a lot of the people listed there have that drive. We are what some people would call in the midst of an overblown stock market. Some people even look at the real estate market and say, yeah, it's overblown. It, it's it's all got to drop out at some point. Is it possible that these pathways you're describing won't look as good in the future? Like if you had started doing some of these things right before 2008, let's say the stock market drops, the real estate market drops out. Is it possible that the times we're in right now make this path to financial independence look a little easier than it may truly be? It's not possible. It's absolute. The last, what, 12 years of our economy have made pathways to early financial independence way easier than they would be in a typical economy. But that doesn't mean that a pathway to early FI can't still get you there decades before 65. So yeah, Craig Curlop, you mentioned, featured freak in my book, good friend of mine. He reached financial independence at age 27. Now, he, he's another example. He didn't stop working. He started his own business, real estate team here in Denver, Colorado, and he's crushing it there. But, and he had the luxury of an economy and a real estate market in Denver that was, that was like a bull market times 10. Like everything's been going right for him. Had it not, had the, the market crashed, either real estate or stock market or both, that would have prolonged his journey to FI, but it wouldn't have ended it. You know, if the if the markets crashed, it's not that now he has to work till 65. Maybe it would have taken him an extra 10 years, say. So maybe he reaches FI at 37 instead of 27. Well, that's still almost three decades before the average Joe out there. So most people would probably take that deal. You mentioned Jabbar a few minutes ago. Tell us about some of the other fun stories that have come out of your high school. Yeah, well, first. I kind of have these two worlds I live in. I, I'm a high school teacher, so I have all my students in my classes and love them to death. And we, we have conversations about FI on a regular basis in my classroom. The other world I live in is my Sheik's Freaks community, which is an online community, which is where I know Jabbar. I've actually never met Jabbar in person, but I've known him for about two years. And that community is where I really have collected these, these highly motivated kids who are, who are of that perfect mindset that are super driven, driven enough to join a community and participate and engage and, and, and contribute. And so the stories that have come out of that community, because to be honest, Doc, this early five stuff for teens, I like to say that we are talking about freaks, people who are different. It is not for every teenager. I would, if you, if you wanted to put a number on it, I would say maybe at best, 20% of teenagers would even read this book and, and less would actually start initiating some of the concepts and strategies. Um, and that's fine. You can't make every teenager, <laughs> you can't, you can't make any teenager do something you don't want that they don't want to do. You can lead the horse to water kind of thing. So uh, people ask me all the time, what do you need to do to make kids want to learn about money? And I say, I don't have the answer to that. Nobody does. I, what do you got to do to make kids want to learn about math or science? Or what do you got to do to make kids want to clean their room? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, You know, if they don't want to do it and they're not going to do it, that's where it comes back to that mindset. A very small percentage of of teenagers or or 20 year olds are going to really digest this information and and, and use it. and, and, And that's fine. So some other great stories, you know, the Sheik's Freeze community isn't just about you know, we are real estate kind of focused, but it's not just that. We have conversations about mindset and frugality and side hustles and passive income and entrepreneurship. We have guests on all the time. I have young people in that community who have started their own podcasts, more, more than one. They have their own blog sites. They have their own small businesses. They have their own side hustles, doing crazy, awesome things just to earn extra money, couch flipping, yard game rentals, just really impressive stuff. You know, things that, again, going way back to your introduction, teenage Dan Sheiks, this is stuff that he would have never, never even contemplated. But these kids are, are amazing go-getters, hustlers, grinders, and that's why they are freaks. <laughs> so you mentioned that 20% of the population, let's say 20 or 10% of your class really takes to these kind of messages. 
tell me why it's important to teach about financial independence to the rest. What are the 80 or 90% who may not be as aggressive, who might not end up being Sheik's freaks? What do they get out of this conversation? Yeah, it goes back to that analogy I had earlier of that spectrum of working till you're 65, reaching FI as early as possible. So I think, I strongly believe that every every person should at least be aware that this pathway exists and know some of the basics. It may be that they never decide to, to include any of those tactics in their life, and that's fine. Or it may be just not the right time. You know, maybe I teach a teenager about early FI in my classroom, and 10 years from now, they're in their corporate job, and their life is miserable. They hate their job. They wake up every morning. It's a struggle to get out of bed and a light bulb goes off and says, man, I don't want to do this for another 30 years. What am I, what am I doing? I'm not happy. I'm not enjoying life. I'm working 60 hours a week. And then at that point, they're like, you know what? I remember this stuff my teacher talked about or that book I read or that person I talked to, that podcast, that YouTube. I remember that option. Maybe I need to Google that and learn a little bit more about what that option is now. Uh, yeah, I want to second that thought, because as I think back on my own trajectory, if you had tried to teach me about financial independence in high school, I would have said, no, I'm going to become a doctor. I have no interest in this stuff. But when I finally got to that place of burnout in my career, I had no concept of financial independence or what it was. I wonder if I had been exposed to it during high school, if that transition would have been easier, or if I would have spent less years grinding it out unhappy, because I would have it would have taken me less time to figure out that there's another way. And that question that you're asking yourself, Doc, is, is the, the, my motivation for giving kids this information now so that they don't have to ask themselves that question when they're our age. Let's talk about the pandemic. Has it changed the way people think about financial independence? Are kids more or less receptive as they've lived through this pandemic and had to be virtually schooled? I don't, I think the jury's still out on how kids are going to come out of this pandemic. Cause to be honest, it's not over. My school is still struggling with, with the aftermath. I mean, we still are wearing masks and stuff, but the, the emotional toll that it has taken on teachers and students is still very, very real. We just had a, me- a staff meeting the other day about how this year has looked so different, even though everyone's in school all day, every day we are not the same. And I don't know that we ever will be. So the jury is still out on how the pandemic will affect students, how it will change the way they look at money, change the way they look at anything in life. Honestly, I think maybe for adults, the same is true. It's just too early to tell. And I think that jabs well also with the fact that Gen Zers are a very different generation. I think millennials are too. But you know, if we're going to stereotype them they're very, they're very topically focused. They have passions about the environment and passions about, you know, equity in the workplace. And there's certainly a cons- more of a consideration, I think, of work-life balance. So it's going to be interesting to see how the pandemic, as well as just the generational difference that we're seeing in young people today will affect their opinions of money. I always feel my generation, Gen X, was a very straightforward generation. Like we like to, you know, we went, we decided we were going to work hard. We're going to make as much money as we could. And we didn't really step out of line. And I think Gen Z makes maybe wiser choices. It's interesting to think about how they will embrace this new financial information. Financial independence gives people freedom in a lot of ways. And I think Gen Z probably will embrace that freedom more than some of the earlier generations would. And my suspicion is that the pandemic will push them even farther in that direction. And I wonder if you'll see that over the next few years. I I think, yeah, I think you're, I think the pandemic in the long run will make us all stronger. You know, we, we will have survived it. We will have learned from it, I hope. And it will just make us tougher. And, and if you're a young, if you're 15 and, and you live through the pandemic, I mean, to be that age and have that kind of traumatic event affect your life, it is going to make, I think, make them tougher and maybe, maybe more willing to take risk, maybe, maybe more willing to start that business or do something different than the norm. Yes, it, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So we're talking about your book, First to a Million. It hits me that 
not just kids, but you're going to get a lot of adults reading this book if they're diving in and they're interested in putting their kid on this pathway. They're thinking, hey, this sounds like this could be really good for my child. What's kind of the first step? What can they do with their child? How do they get started on helping them see this pathway and what it could mean to their life? Selfishly, the first step is to buy my book and give it to them. I'll I'll That's go fair. with that. That's fair. And I love what you said. I, I absolutely hope that a lot of adults read the book. And to be honest, I don't care what age you are. If you're brand new to the early fi world and concepts, then my book is the book for you. Even though it has teenager on the cover, that doesn't matter. But if you're if you're the adult and you're gifting it to a teenager, read the book and, and then sit down and have conversations. There's There's a lot of really interesting concepts in there. I mean, numerous discussions can be had at the dinner table or on a bike ride or in the car ride about each and every chapter, I think. And so read read it together, buy two copies, (laughs) buy two copies and read it together and make a book club in your house and, and talk about all that stuff. Yeah. As I was reading, you know, I was thinking that this information certainly is just as good for adults as it is for teenagers I think it was Oprah who who was famous for saying, when you know better, you do better. And as I was reading your book, I was thinking that introducing these topics to young people will give them more knowledge. Whether they choose to follow it or not, it's more likely to help them make the choices eventually in life that will benefit them. Even if financial independence is something they're not interested in, fire may not be something they really want to obtain, but just this idea of being a better steward of our decisions and money, I think rings true for teenagers as well as adults. It's been a pleasure talking to you about your book, First to a Million. I'm going to end this episode the way I end every episode by asking you what's up next in your life. And if people are interested, how can they find you and interact with you online? Yeah. What's up next is really the book's going to be out there in the world. And I hope it, you know, my mission in writing the book was to help as many young people as I could live their best life. And that isn't that they have to reach Phi early. That just, again, it's all about giving them options. Same with my community that I have. My online community is, is the same mission, helping young people live their best life. So what's up next is I, the community is growing strong. We're, we're engaged in a new platform, which I'm really excited about. We have an app that will be coming out well, by the time this episode airs, I think it'll be live. And the book launches December 6th. And so if people want to go to biggerpockets.com to get the book, they will get some bonus content, the extra featured freak case studies we mentioned. They'll get some downloadable financial sheets specifically for teenagers. If they buy the workbook and the book together, they'll get a nice discount on the pair. So I highly recommend going to Bigger Pockets to buy those. If anybody out there knows a teenager or you are a teenager, check out sheiksfreaks.com, the website. Right at the top, you'll see a button to join the community that we have a free community version. We have a premium community version. They're both awesome. But if your listeners, if, if a teenager wants to join the, the paid membership, if they want to enter the coupon code DOC, D-O-C, all lowercase, we'll give them a nice discount on the the annual membership for that. There's a seven day free trial so they can test it out without without any charges and see if it's the right place for them. But like I mentioned earlier, the the young people in that group are doing amazing things and we we have a fun time together. So yeah, I look forward to meeting as many young people as I can that that are interested in this pathway. The book is First to a Million, A Teenager's Guide to Achieving Early Financial Independence. This has been the Earn and Invest podcast. On behalf of myself, Doc G, I'd like to thank Dan Sheeks. That's a wrap. Hey, hey, I just wanted to remind you that not only is Dan Sheik's book coming out December 6th, but a good friend of mine, Jail Collins, just put out a book, How I Lost Money in Real Estate Before It Was Fashionable, A Cautionary Tale. You can check it out. It is a great read. Go to jailcollinsnh.com. I wrote a blurb for this book. I really enjoyed it. Jail is a good friend of mine. And you guys know how popular The Simple Path to Wealth was. 
why I believe, I shouldn't say was, how popular the simple path to wealth is, and I believe how I lost money in real estate before it was fashionable will be just as popular and well-loved. Check it out, jlcollinsnh.com. Cool. So tell me what we didn't cover. What didn't we talk about that you wish we did? Man, you had some great questions, Doc. Uh, or Jordan. What, uh, great job. I, you did your research, and I really appreciate that. Um, I could tell you didn't just glance through the book. You actually no, took I, I won't interview someone unless I read their whole book. Because I, 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 otherwise, I feel like I'm useless. Like I want to get to the nitty gritty of what what you have in there. So yeah. and you and you had plenty of things like that that I thought were really worth talking about. Um, this idea of financial independence it always goes back and forth with me because part of me is like, yeah, I wish I knew it when I was young, and I wish I knew it right away. And then part of me is like, yeah, but I wanted to be a kid and do kid stuff. Mm-hmm. And I think that medium that you really bring out is let's start introducing it now. And so there's going to be that 10 or 15% who just gloms on it and loves it. Well, it's great for them. But then for the other 85%, it's like, okay, now you know it's there. Yeah. And as you make your journey yeah. in the adult world, you'll always have that back there to utilize as necessary. So maybe 10 or 15% people percent of people grab it right away. Mm-hmm. But maybe over the next two or three decades, another 20 or 30% of people come back to it. Yeah. And that's huge. Yeah. I, I love the way you, that you uh, phrase that because it's so true. Uh, now I'm, I'm the same. I, I, I did the double whammy. I racked up a ton of student loan debt. And then in my 20s, when I graduated from college, I didn't want to work corporate. I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I just started traveling. Um, I was working, but I started racking up a lot of credit card debt with traveling. I wouldn't change that for the world. The experiences I had made me who I am today, but it's taken me a couple of decades to dig out of that debt and for my wife and I to, to build a considerable amount of net worth. That's just my path, um, which is why I'm really clear when I talk to young people, I say, I'm telling you these different strategies and I'm giving you lots of options, but I cannot tell you what to do. Uh, I just talked to one of my students today. Um, she wrote in a letter that was in an assignment that she wants to take a gap year after high school. And I went up to her and I said, tell me more about this. She's like, well, I just don't know about going to college. I said, a gap year is an amazing idea. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, go, don't, don't spend a lot of money, rack up credit card debt, traveling the world, do some service work, take some time to learn to get you to know yourself, try out a career, try out a job, make a little bit of money, but you know, college will be there after that year. Um, or, or maybe you decide it's not for you, but uh, and, and she doesn't know anything. Well, I've talked a couple of days in that class about Phi, but she's just really just trying to decide what she wants to do. You know, everyone has a different path. And so this book is really about just making them aware of an option. And like you said, maybe they glam onto it right away and maybe they're off and running, or maybe they never do, or maybe five or 10, 20 years down the road, they come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think so it's to answer your question earlier, I, I think you, I think you hit everything. Um, I, I, and I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. Like I said, it was it was a pleasure to read it. And um, yeah, I think these are good messages. And I think the, the hardest part that I find um, is that a lot of kids don't really want to talk about this stuff yet, right? So I know a lot of people who are like, I want to take this to the schools. I want to take it to colleges. And they really start excited. And then they go to colleges and realize that people just aren't yet ready for that message. And yes. I think that's the hardest thing about young people. It's hard enough to tell a 40-year-old, hey, you could do things a little differently. Here's a way to financial independence. But young people just have so many other things going on in their life. They're not, they're yeah. not, you know, taking care of a child and worried financially and realizing that they're stuck in a job that they're never going to get out of type thing. Um, yeah. And so I, I think was, that's always difficult. I was at a conference last weekend where uh FinCon. So I my Craig Carlop was there. Cody Berman was there. Rachel Richards was there. Sarah, Sarah Williams, my other preacher freak. And, and we talk all the time about that exact idea. And everyone knows I'm a high school teacher and I teach personal finance. And, and so they'll always ask me that question. I mentioned, like, how do you make kids want to learn about money? How do you, what do you do to make? And I said, I don't have, you don't. <laughs> it, it's impossible. You can't just, just like, if you go down to the street and I remember having this conversation vividly, we were outside walking on the sidewalk. I was walking with these people and they, they were 
we were having this conversation. I, I said, just like all these people out here on the sidewalk who had nothing to do with the conference, we were in Austin. I said, if you walk up to any one of those people, maybe one or two out of 10 of these adults are interested in learning about money. The rest of them couldn't care less. They're, yeah. they're just, all they know is they can pay their bills and that's all they care about. And so the children are no different. They're, you can't make them do it. Uh, yeah, for sure. But you can expose them. And that's, I yes. think, the, the key. And that's yeah. that's what the book does. And again, I think this book has value for adults. Well, thanks for coming on. I will get a copy of this to you a few days before it goes live. So you can take a listen to it and make sure you're okay with everything. I assume you will be. Everything came out great. Um, if you enjoyed this experience and you think about it or happen to be on Apple, leave me a review because basically uh, that helps the podcast grow. And I want to get it to as many people as possible so that I can expose them to your book.